Mmm, baby, you listening to the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I'm going to share my kind of embarrassing and very painful ski experience with you. So I headed to the summit at Snoqualmie this past week to do some skiing with my kid, and we were psyched to check out Hyatt or Summit East or whatever you want to call it. And anyways, we get into the parking lot to boot up, and I'm carrying me and my kid's skis to the ski area. My kid has our poles. And it is icy in the lot as I'm walking, and I slip a few times, but I catch myself. No big deal, but it is slick as shit. But then it happened. My feet slid out from underneath me. I was airborne, parallel to the ground, and I slammed so hard, tailbone first into the ground. I was writhing in pain on the ground while people were walking by, stopping to look at me, but no one really asked if I was okay. They were just staring at me, which I understand. We are in the middle of a global pandemic, and there's no need to help the guy who's on the ground. And I stayed on the ground for about three minutes in total agony. But really, I have a high tolerance for pain, so I was able to get up, shake it off, and Keaton and I headed over to the ski lift. I tell him that I think I'd be able to ski, and I see if he's shaken up at all. He has a little headache as my skis hit him in the helmet as I was falling down. Like with all my weight, I fell down, my ski edge went right into his helmet, and you can see a gouge that I took out of it, but it didn't hurt him too bad. He was just a little shaken up. And thank God he was wearing that helmet, or we would have been off to get some stitches. So from there, I'm hurt, but I'm also kind of fine. We head up the lift, and I think I'm going to be good enough to make it through the day. But to tell you the truth, I was so happy when we were done skiing that day, because I knew something in my ass area did not feel right. When I got home, I try and figure out what's going on. I sat down to do a sit-up, and I am met with a sharp pain that almost produces tears. So something is definitely wrong, and I'm at the point where I'm going to give it a week and hope the pain goes away. Right now, I'm about three days in, and the pain is subsiding a little bit, given I can't do a sit-up. The good news is, I can sit, I can ski, I can lay down. It's everything else that hurts. But what doesn't hurt is my voice, and I used it to record another amazing podcast with another living legend. Shannon Dunn Downing lived on the podium in the 90s. She invented so many tricks and brought a style and amplitude to the table and snowboarding that was missing at the time. She helped change the game, and she paved the way for riders today like Chloe Kim, who should listen to the podcast so they can know their roots. But before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you to do a few things for me. First, please follow me on Instagram, at the Powell Movement. Second, please tell a friend about the show. It really helps things grow. And third, it would be great if you subscribe wherever you listen to the podcast. Finally, I want to thank my amazing sponsors who make this show happen. They are Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Stanley, Weed Maps, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Glade Optics. Now, let's talk to Shannon Dunn Downing. I interviewed your husband a couple times recently. He's legendary snowboarder Dave Downing. And before he was a pro snowboarder, he was in the industry. He was like a worker bee that ended up with a golden ticket of sorts to go on a photo shoot in Europe with you. This is where you have a love at first sight and a God moment all rolled up into one. And we'll talk about that later. But at this point in your career, it's the early 90s. You're on top of the pro snowboarding world. And that world is one that's dominated by men. And I would think that not hooking up with a dude on a photo shoot That would be a good thing for most women's careers. I mean, no one wants to get a reputation for hooking up with a guy on a trip and being that girl. Did you ever see that in snowboarding where girls would come in and end up hooking up with dudes on trips and eventually they did get that reputation? (laughs) That's really a funny perspective (laughs) because I never thought about that. It seemed like girls in snowboarding were just respected and it wasn't like you have to hook up with a guy to make your way in the sport. But, you know, like Dave and I, you know, it wasn't like an insta hookup thing. It was just like I got to know him on that trip. And then after that, I was like, oh, this guy's totally different. He's a different kind of guy. And that's what kind of drew me to Dave. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to hook up with this guy. <laughs> right, right. And I think we're going to talk about how that all kind of came together later on. But I was kind of more going with just earning a reputation in snowboarding because This really leads me to a question that I'm going to ask for one of my sponsors. It's my Weed Maps question of the podcast, and it's happening very early in the show, something that I haven't done yet before. But snowboarding is a raw and edgy sport, especially back then. It was kind of like skateboarders who grew up with money. 
So while the masses looked at all snowboarders as sketchy kind of dirtbaggish back in the day, and you personally, from what I gather, you're not going to have that kind of reputation for doing bad things because I don't think you were part of the smoking cigarettes or smoking weed or drinking a shit done part of snowboarding. But you were around then, and I'm sure you were lumped into a crowd where there was guilt by association. And actually, that's all an assumption on my part. Were you a partier back in the day, or is that just... No, I, I wasn't really much of a partier, and I've, I've never smoked weed in my life. But I was definitely lumped in with the dirt bags of snowboarders, of, you know, what people thought of snowboarding, which is really hilarious to me back then, even because I grew up skiing, and I was a skier. And then I became a snowboarder, and then instantly you're like this dirtbag party goer. But, you know, that was always just hypocritical way of thinking. Of course, we can see that now. But even back then, I was just like, well, this is so ridiculous, like over the top ridiculous that people would assume that these snowboarders are just lumped into this one kind of person. Well, there were a lot of people that were living that party lifestyle, it seemed like. Oh, totally. Especially back in your day, where now it's more athletes, especially on the competition realm. It's like people have to really worry about their bodies. But back then, it didn't seem like there was the athletic part of it as much as there was the lifestyle. It was all about going out, having a good time, and then you'd be competing in the morning, given you wouldn't be the foggy, hungover one in the morning like a lot of other people, which probably worked out to your advantage. Yeah, I mean, it was like definitely a huge party scene. But then in general, I would say our age group, being young, right out of high school or whatever, and even in high school, that age group is just partying anyway. But then I think when these like snowboarder guys were getting paid and they were just spending their money on just like going off and partying. And I just thought of Damien Sanders had this huge raging party. I think it was like 1992 or 93 or something. And you know, I went to Big Bear with Tina and this is kind of like I get thrown into the lion's den sort of <laughs> like with this like party scene because I'm like staying with Tina and there's like all these guys going off like they came back from partying and demolished the rental house that we were staying in, throwing furniture. And I mean, they weren't mad. They were just doing it out of. Um, they're having a good time. They're having a good time and just totally destroying that rental house, you know, and um, I remember the next day, Lisa Hudson, she worked for Airwalk. And so she had to foot the bill and she had to pay for like two weeks of lost rent because that's how long it was going to take to repair the house. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? And so after that trip to Big Bear, we caught a ride with like Dana Nicholson and stayed at his house in Huntington Beach. And Damian Sanders had a party and he was getting into the party scene because I think he tore his ACL or something and he was injured. And he, that's when he totally got into like hosting these huge parties, just massive amounts of people in Huntington. And it got broken up by helicopters and there were like 30 cops that came and broke it up. And I was like, what's going on? So yeah, it was definitely a, a next level, the party scene for sure, you know. But you throw in, like I was saying, you throw in money to these kids that are having the time of their life snowboarding, and that's what happened. <laughs> All right, well, that's my Weed Maps question, and here is their ad. Weed Maps is exactly what it sounds like. It's simply the place to go online when it comes to finding what you need so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. The cannabis market can be a bit of a treasure hunt, but Weed Maps will get you straight to the source with no worries. Whether you're seeking out the best locations, deals, doctors, or strains, we offer online ordering and delivery where legal. No need to waste your precious time searching elsewhere. Go to WeedMaps.com or download the free app today. It's your ultimate guide to cannabis. Weed Maps. Now, getting back to Dave and his golden ticket trip, while you don't make Dave's career, you were the one that put in a few good words for him and you got him the hookups he needed to film with Hatchet and Mac Dog, and that's a really big deal and it helped make him take his career to the next level. If you two had not met on that trip, what do you think would have happened with Dave's snowboard career? I don't know. You never know, but it seems like if he wasn't on that trip, he wouldn't really have a snowboard career, not because of me, but because... That trip changed like so many things and like the people that were there's lives and trans world was there. Jeff Curtis was there, a photographer. 
And then the Burton team manager, Eric Koch at the time, he was there and everything came together and then the conditions were there. And it was just like a really amazing trip. And you probably heard from Dave's interview that Cersei Wallace was supposed to go on that trip and then she tore her ACL and got injured. Well, originally, let me go back a little bit, is that I did a photo shoot with Jeff Curtis for my Sunflower snowboard for Sims, like the first pro model. Yep. So that's where I met Jeff and he invited me to go to this Italy trip. And I was like, oh, this is killer because like Tina and I have to go to a contest in Italy right around that same time anyway. So he's like, oh, Tina should come too. So we got our tickets early to go early to Italy before the event to do this photo shoot. And then Jeff calls and he says, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't really realize that Transworld already has a group. So basically we get uninvited and you feel so bad. And I'm like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. I talked to Tina and she's like, let's just go early anyway. And we'll just kind of figure it out. Like we'll go be tourists somewhere. I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out. Then we get a call from Jeff saying, you know, Cersei blew out her knee and then they need some girls to go. And since you guys already have tickets, the guy, Jamie Meiselman, he wants you to go. So we're like, okay, killer. Like we already have our flight. So it's all set. And then I think that they were working on this group sort of separately. Who's going on this group? And so anyway, it ends up that, the Burton team guy, Eric, invites Brian Thien and Dave Downing, who I thought was Dave Dowd. I was like, Dave Dowd was a racer guy, right. the snowboard racer guy. I was like, any kind of older. And I was like, why is Dave Dowd going on this trans world trip, freestyle trip? That does not make sense. But anyway, obviously, it wasn't Dave Dowd. It was Dave Downing, who I had never heard of. We go on this trip, and Dave gets like killer shots and gets to know everybody. And it was just awesome. And so from there this group that went we stayed as a group and tina's like invited all of us to utah so let's go to utah and everything steamrolled and in this male dominated world you are a woman who kickstarted things for dave it's kind of when i'm thinking about it all like looking at his career it took a woman to come in and snowboarding which there's like five of you at that point and you're able to make a career for dave <laughs> it just sort of worked out that way so you know i was sponsored by sins at that time with my Sunflower Sport. And so Gaylene Nagel was my team manager. And she called me. I was at a contest and she's like, Hey, I set up this photo shoot or this video shoot with you with Mac Dog. It's going to be in Utah on the state. Anyway, so I'm like, Okay, cool. And I had never videoed before in my life. And that was in Utah. And then Tina's like, Hey, to the group that was in Italy, like, come to my house, stay at my house, and we'll just meet up, you know, after, because that trip was so awesome. I'm going to be home in Utah at that time. And so there's two groups for Mac Dog. It's like, go with Mac Dog, and then there's a Kurt Heine group, which is kind of like the B group. Right. And I don't know why I got in the A group, because I'm definitely not the A film. <laughs> I didn't have too many tricks in my bag for, uh, like, just going off jumps, you know. And you're a first timer. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't filmed for one. You know, Dave grew up going to Big Bear and off jumps and stuff, and like Steamboat didn't have anything. It's like my only jump was a cat track and side hits, you know, not even a half pipe. So my only kind of chance of learning stuff was on the road and off side hits and stuff like that. So anyway, I get put in this group with Jim Rippey, and, you know, Jim is the gnarliest guy ever. So I'm with Jim Rippey, and then, you know, I asked, dog or hey you know mac dog do you think my boyfriend can come on this photo shoot because i mean dave's in town and he's totally capable and can my boyfriend come and he's like okay well he's with the kurt heidi group and then dave ended up just going off doing super good you know getting the shots tons of shots and then dogger's like well i want to take him out because this guy's going off and then I like fell on a rock and I'm like with Rippy pointing out stuff going on. I'm going to go off this cliff, do a backflip, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Just like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. So it was really funny. Yeah. I mean, I look at it as you and Dave had totally different careers. In the Venn diagram, the crossover would be filming in the backcountry because you did some of that. But your career was based on contest writing. And I would say that your level of fame was much bigger than Dave's, especially in the mainstream world. But in a world that is dominated by men, especially then, you were both paid to be snowboarders to produce content or win or do whatever you're supposed to do as a pro rider. 
But when you both have the same sponsor in Burton, and this is later on in the career, who's able to make more money from that sponsor? Is Dave able to make more money because he has a penis? Or are you able to make more money because you are doing better than him? (laughs) That's really funny. I did make more money than him. And I think there's a lot of opportunity that we discovered. I want to say we discovered as a group of athletes and as an industry, and we kind of proved it. A big proof was my sunflower board. And nobody really knew how that was going to sell, but it went off the charts. And so that just really opened the door. I think for the industry, it was like proof, like this woman's product selling more than the guys. Like we sold more sunflower boards at Sims than the men's boards. And so that just proved that there was like a huge market. And so there's just so many women's products after that. Like Tina had her pro model. So we could just collectively just stand up and just say, hey, we're worth this much and we're going to give you a return on your investment sponsors, you know? So there was a lot of opportunity, but we also had to stand up for what I thought it was worth and do my own contracts. I didn't have an agent. There wasn't really agents at the time. There were a few and they were really outside the industry and really didn't have a good reputation. And I just felt like I could stand up for myself a lot better than these agents could negotiating contracts. And then that led to like Eric Koch, the Burton team manager, asked if I would ride for Burton. And I was like, well, that's kind of the ultimate, you know, like Burton, Burton's just. They had taken over. Yeah, but they just had such good product and there's just so much opportunity. They're just a good business, you know? Yeah. And a lot of people have always been like Burton so corporate, but they just have good stuff and they care. Like Jake's, Jake Burton's always cared to be, he want he wanted to be the best company. He wanted to have the best product. He put the most amount of money for R&D into his product. And there's people that work just their butt off in marketing and product development in every area. So I didn't want to pass that up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, from those Burton days, I mean, that was, I would think, the pinnacle of your career when you get on that brand and just kind of how everything's coming together for you at that point. Because in the mid to late 90s, you were totally dominant. You're dominant on a Burton board. And who are your other big sponsors during your heyday? I had Oakley. Later on, you know, it was like Nixon and Hurley. But Prom was one of my big sponsors. You own them, them, right? I didn't own it, but Tina and I designed and developed that women's outerwear line called Prom. And so we both named it and drew products. And Tina was really, really good. Actually, she came up with the name Prom and we were going through a list of names. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. We both love that name. And there was so much marketing you could attach to that name. And so that's when we dressed in the prom dresses and did the whole prom dress campaign. And Peter Lyon was a part of Swag, which Swag was the parent company. So Lisa Hudson was our team manager from Airwalk and then switched to this company Swag. And so she's like, hey, girls, I want you to do a line of women's outerwear. So that was a big sponsor and a great opportunity for marketing and another opportunity for developing women's products and showing and proving that women wanted women's products. I mean, they were, it was like pink jacket, you know, because pink wasn't out ever. And really what we had worn in the past was like men's sample barges. So if you see any photos of me prior to that, it's men's large sample outerwear. It's just giant clothing. So were you always frustrated whenever you got a box from your sponsors and you're so excited to open the box and then you look and it's like, oh, I'm going to look like an idiot in this too. I got to figure out a way to wear it. (laughs) I didn't think like that at all. I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so stoked. Somebody gave me free stuff to wear and somebody's going to pay me to snowboard. Right. Like I didn't have any other experience. I mean, yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to roll these pants up three times on the top and two times on the bottom and then either sew it in or pin it or something. So I just didn't look totally ridiculous. But at the same time, I was just stoked to travel and 
get paid to snowboard. This was like the best thing ever, you know? I can imagine because when you get into it, snowboarding is not even really a sport. I mean, it's so brand new. And then by the time you're 19, 20 years old and money's starting to come in from snowboarding, it's kind of like you're blown away. Like my passion right now is paying me. This is crazy. And when was the first year you could make like six figures riding your snowboard? Ooh, six figures. Maybe, (sighs) I, I, I mean, selling that, uh, sunflower board that was a major income i got royalties on that board and then my contract with burton and that i had a pro model with them so once pro model started and you started getting royalties is when six figures would start coming in because that's insane being a woman in a male dominated world given where you say that there are tons of opportunities but i still think everything would skew towards the men in that sport And no one gets into snowboarding for money, but when it comes into play, is it something that you think about? Like, hey, we're making less than our equal peers and the guys, or is it just you're happy to be paid? Well, when we proved that there was a market for women and I could sell more stuff than the guys, I put my foot down when I negotiated. And I could say, sponsoring me is going to equal this much money for you because I have proof. So although I wasn't paid equally as those guys that had pro models, say, if I'm going to be like, like for like, like what I'm doing for marketing and gaining money for their company, like for like, I wasn't getting the same amount, but you'd have to have like statistical numbers almost. So, I mean, it was like, we had to work on product. We had to work on marketing and getting out visually into the media, like the magazines. And we had to work with the contest directors, like, hey, you need to give us more airtime. And, you know, there's always a fight like, well, no girls are watching and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you don't know that if you don't air us, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's always something else for you to do. It's like for the guys, they show up and they have to compete. But you have to show up, then you have to go find the people running production and say, hey, we need more airtime. There's probably a whole bunch of other things you have to do just to get women in the door. Yeah, so we had to really build women in the sport. That was like our goal. Like Tina and I, our goal was to get coverage in the media so that we could build this, so that we could have a job, so that we could get paid. And we understood that. So that was like a big thing is promoting women and making it look fun and making it look feminine. Because to us, like a regular girl wasn't the tomboy. Those were such a small part of the demographic, you know? Yep. The masses of girls are feminine and they do their nails and they do their hair. And we wanted to show like, hey, you can also be athletic and you can do this sport. It's not that hard. It's not really extreme like the media portrays. It's just pretty easy to learn and it's really fun. And if you can ski, you're definitely can snowboard. You know, you shouldn't be afraid of it. So everything as far as like presenting that to the media from like a hang tag on a piece of clothing to marketing collateral, we wanted it to look relatable to the masses of women, not just the core that the snowboard industry always wanted to promote like the core girl, the most gnarliest girl. But really, Tina and I worked together. We wanted to portray to the masses of girls like, hey, this is an easy sport. And you don't have to do it just because your boyfriend does. You can do it because it's just really a fun thing to do outside. Now it's time for a sponsor break, and my first sponsor is the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing the best beer in the Northwest since 2006, and they started as a bunch of friends who live beer, brewing, and drinking it outside. Over the years, they have grown, but they have never forgotten their roots in skiing, snowboarding, and biking. I could list the countless things they have done for the sports and athletes, or even better, list the things they've done for the causes like the Surf Rider Foundation and Protect Our Winners, but I don't have enough time. What I do have time to do is ask you to pick up a six pack of 10 barrel next time you're at the store. And if you are more of a booze person, 10 barrel mixed drinks pack a punch. To find out more about all things 10 barrel, head on over to 10barrel.com. My final sponsor in this break is Stanley, and they pretty much invented the category of containers that keep things hot and cold over a hundred years ago. 
what was revolutionary back then is essential and more important than ever right now. This year, if you are going to do the mountain or any outdoor activity right, you are going to need to have soups, coffee, water, hot chocolate, whatever you possibly can in the car, in your pack, and most likely you don't have all the containers you're going to need to keep them hot or cold. Good thing is, I'm going to save you 30% on all Stanley products. To get the deal, head on over to stanley-pmi.com, go shopping, and enter the code DRINKFAST, that's all one word, all lowercase at checkout, and you will get that deal as well. Those are my sponsors for this round, now let's jump back into the podcast. We started this podcast out with a lot of heavy hitting stuff that I usually don't have (laughs) that much in the beginning. You know, we talked about Dave, a little bit of money, partying, women and snowboarding. We haven't even touched on religion, that will come later. But this is your story and it's about you and your story has a start. And it starts with hockey in Chicago. And did you (laughs) grow up in rink life with like mom, dad and brother? Total rink life. So (laughs) my dad was like, you know, before he had kids, he was in a hockey and semi-pro hockey. He's from Boston, which is hockey's everything in Boston. And I grew up in Chicago in the suburbs, which is where my mom's family is from. And my dad, you know, he was a hockey coach for kids, like a triple A league. And my brother played hockey and I figure skated and I speed skated. So we grew up around the ice rink. My dad had a retail shop. In our spare time, we were at the rink, you know, helping my dad with his businesses and stuff like that. And I always wanted to play hockey, but I was too shy. I didn't want to play on a boys hockey team because there wasn't any girls hockey team. So, yeah, it was just total hockey. Figure skating. I was in figure skating. Competitively? Yeah, like mostly ice shows and, yeah, competitive. But I was so shy and I just felt like, gosh, I'm not good enough. So... I would just kind of shy away from all that. But yeah, I did a little bit of figure skating competition. But I was really, you know, I had a pair of hockey skates also. And I would go play with my brother. And I really wanted to play hockey. Are you a little tomboy? I wasn't a tomboy, but most people think I was a tomboy. But I wouldn't consider myself a tomboy because all my friends were girls and I liked girly things. I wore dresses and I'd get just totally covered in dirt. So I was kind of like... The mix of both? I was just following my brother, but a total girl, if that makes any sense. And I wanted to do what my big brother did. And he's like an aggro brother. Let me just say that. So my brother was just gung-ho into everything. And he was also pushing me like, you can do this. You got to do this. Come on. (laughs) Like, okay. And at this point in your life, whether you know it or not, you're being bred for snowboarding. It's like the snurfer barely exists back then, but you're skating, you're skiing, you do gymnastics, you're speed skating, you're living on edges. And all of that stuff translates later on in life to just giving you the balance and the coordination that you have. Yeah, I mean, definitely it's athleticism and that definitely translates. And hey, it didn't really take that much to be good at snowboarding in the beginnings of competitive snowboarding. I mean, the first event, half pipe event that I won, I did an alley oop. And, <laughs> you know, there were like five other girls, and you do something beside a straight air, if you could call them airs. Hey, you're going to win. So <laughs> I figured that out. And then I was like, oh, I kind of want to like push myself a little bit more and see what the guys are doing and try those tricks. Yeah. And before we can even get you on a snowboard, First, your dad needs to want to shift his career and he starts selling insurance and that creates an opportunity to move to Steamboat in the 80s. Do you remember the culture shock of leaving Chicago and going to Steamboat, which is like a town of nothing at that point? Oh, yeah, it was crazy. So my dad, he kind of got scammed in this. He bought into this manufacturing business where he was stamping NHL hockey pucks. And he packaged accessories for skating, like skate guards and things for ankles and stuff like that. So the guy, he bought it from a lot. It was just like this bad business situation. And he's like, okay, well, I want something more stable, a stable career for my family. His dream was always to move to the Rocky Mountains, total John Denver style. So he got his insurance license. So he had the opportunity to to be a state farm insurance agent in one of the towns was in Steamboat Springs. 
And I just remember telling my friends that I was moving to Steamboat Springs. And then we all just laughed because I was like, is that really the name of this town? Steamboat <laughs> Springs? <laughs> like, What is this town? Where are we going? And we come from the suburbs of Chicago and we pull in to Steamboat for the first time because I hadn't been there until we drove out and moved there. And there was one stoplight in town and we're like, are you kidding me? In the nearest city, suburbia was Denver, which is three hours away. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, what have we done? You know, I was nine. I was young. But still, it's just everything I knew was left behind, you know. Do they just try to shut you up by getting you on the mountain and getting you into skiing? Yeah, really, that was the only thing to kind of do. I mean, they didn't really have a gymnastics program. And I just, in Chicago, I went from kind of like a rack gymnastics place to like one of the top gymnastics, like, you know, Olympic training gymnastics centers. Yep. And I was so bummed to leave that because they were super strict in how like you got to do your handstand perfect you got to do your back bend perfect but I like loved it and I was just learning how to properly do all these things and I loved it so much so that was like a huge bummer like I was like oh my gosh they don't even have gymnastics they had an ice rink on the rodeo ground which was melted half the time and <laughs> Steamboat has a winter ski club and they have a mountain in town, which is kind of cool. And they have like 70 meter, 90 meter ski jumps. It's like a full ski training facility. And then the summer they had ramps into the water where you can like freestyle ramps. Yep. So that was like the introduction. We moved in the summer and we just thought that that would be fun, like a fun activity. And it was a challenge for sure. And then we stuck with the ski team in the winter and like I really did not like ski racing at all so like just the structure and the rules yeah like I love structure of sports but I did not like the structure of going around certain ski poles I was like this is so dumb like <laughs> I don't want to turn right here and it's a bulletproof ice and it's supposed to be bulletproof ice and I hate that <laughs> I hate that so eventually when snowboarding came around I was so stoked because really what we ended up doing skiing is just bombing the hill and timing ourselves like okay we're gonna see how fast we can get down the mountain because that was the most fun right and trying tricks off the cat tracks for skiing so yeah and ski boat was one of those places where i mean it was a very progressive place steamboat snowboarding was allowed really early i think 87 or 88 and you're in that first wave of snowboarding at steamboat do you remember the first time you ever saw it and you were like hey i want to try this yeah, my friend had like a back hill board and he'd go hiking around and that looked fun. And we got a black snow. Like the plastic sports 30 plastic. boards? Yeah. And so we'd take that in the backyard or on a slope and that was really cool. And then my brother learned the first year Steamboat Allowed snowboarding, 1988. And then he's like, you got to do this. It's so fun. So he then taught me. Does it create a hard stop on skiing for you? Like once you get your first snowboard, you're like, I'm never skiing again. I never skied again. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a board the next day and I was totally done with skiing. And is it just totally chasing your brother and his friends around the mountain and them telling you to drop stuff and you're being like, okay, and that's kind of how you learn how to snowboard? That's your babysitter? Yeah, my brother taught me, but my best friend, Betsy, she learned separately. And so then we would go and... You knew everyone that snowboarded on a mountain, so we'd just end up like meeting up with anyone that snowboarded. We would just start riding with them, and we just kind of learn all together. Like, oh, let's try this little thing, or if it's snow, let's go off this rock. And so you just got the little crew going. Speaking of the crew, because this is all around high school, I would think, when you're getting into snowboarding and what becomes the most important thing to you in life. But... Other than snowboarding, what kind of kid are you in high school? Like, what kind of music are you listening to and what kind of things are you into? I was more shy. And then my best friend was like the outgoing one. Betsy was the crazy one. Betsy was a crazy one. And we would just, I mean, we were just total jokesters. This is so bad, but um, <laughs> this is like our total entertainment in high school. Is We had one class our whole high school career. It was art. 
and we used to lock our art teacher into the dark room <laughs> because he was like so he would just fall for our tactics hey mr galusha come to the dark room and then we'd be like okay let's lock him in and we just thought it was so funny it's so amazing finally he goes you know, it was like the fifth time, I don't know, maybe not five, but maybe like three times. He's like, this is the last time I'm taking you girls to the principal's office. So he's walking, huffing and puffing to the principal's office. And we're like on each of his shoulders going, please, please don't take us to the principal's office. We promise we won't ever do it again. We won't ever do it again. And he stops short of the door, principal's door. And he's like, looks at us and he just shakes his head. And he's just like, okay, you better never do that again. So instead, we just found other things to do. My aunt sent us like these really potent stink bombs. And so we'd throw those in the lunchroom. Oh, so you were fun prankster. And I was going to ask, because I know there is religion coming in your life. I don't know if it was early on. So I was going to ask if you were a young lifer in high school or anything like that. Or does that stuff come later? Yeah, later. Okay, we'll find out when that comes when it comes. I think I know where it does. But with snowboarding, Steamboat is a place where it's not like they have the parks in the early days. Do you get your pipe and park fixed when you're traveling around for contests? And then you're just riding everything at Steamboat and figuring out how to ride? Exactly. Yeah. So there was the Rocky Mountain series. And again, my brother was like, I'm going to do a contest. And I was like, okay, well, I guess we're all going to go. I guess I'm going to do the contest. But I didn't think I was going to do good. So anyway, that was like my introduction to a half pipe was at a contest and I was like, oh, well, I didn't get last. So that's hopeful. And then in Steamboat, I would learn on the side hits. That's where I'd learn tricks for the half pipe. And then I'd try and go early to practice and I'd just stay as late as I could and just practice, practice, practice when I had the opportunity to ride a half pipe. And then the jumps were just cat tracks on the ski area. So it was just trying like 360s off of that and then we didn't really have jumps in a contest for a long time so contests were really just everybody raced and everybody did the pipe you did both you know yep and so you're competing all around Colorado and wherever you can go and your senior year you are all set to go to University of Colorado and you and your brother talk your parents into giving you the credit card and the car or something like that and you're going to go up to Whistler and you're going to go play on the glacier up there you do it like total public style, like the public lane, and there might be a contest yes. where you do well. But you do that, and the pivotal moment on that trip for you is on the way home, I feel like, because you're driving through Seattle, and you take a little detour to go to Mount Hood, because if you don't go to Mount Hood, you're an idiot, right? Like, this is the yeah. dream place to go. And like you said earlier, you were one of those people that wanted to be hiking the pipe longer than anybody else because you never had the opportunity to do it. And just that hard work ethic and like just wanting to ride all day long when you go to Hood, that's what makes you a pro snowboarder from the beginning is one day at Hood and people seeing you ride. Yeah, they were having a Sims photo shoot and, you know, Mount Hood has like the little gully. So the the gully on the other side of the dirt mound, they were having the Sims photo shoot in the half pipe. Like Todd Richards was there and, you know, photographers and stuff like that. But the public pipe was right there. and. I literally have never felt like this ever in my life. It was like this crazy euphoric high kind of like it was kind of later in the day. I was probably just like dehydrated. And and my brother and Betsy was there too, my best friend Betsy. And they were like, okay, you ready to go? I mean, it was like the end of the day. We had pretty much the whole day riding. And I was like, well, I want to just work on a like this trick. And I just started hiking the pipe like at high speed and I was like having the best time of my life and I just couldn't stop and I was like I gotta keep going (laughs) it was the end of the day and Brad Stewart he was the team manager or photographer both for Sims and he came by and I was just oblivious I didn't care who was in the pipe or what was going on I was just like pretty much running up the pipe and taking laps And he stops me and he introduces himself and asks my name. And he's like, here's my card. I really want to talk to you to sponsor you. And I was like, okay, that's like crazy. Yeah. So I took his card and gave him a call, you know, and that was right when he switched over to Moro Snowboards and when Moro started. But when I talked to him, he said, 
this is kind of weird. Like, I know you don't know me, but I, I promise what I'm going to start is something really good. If you could just trust me and call me back, I really would love to have you on the team of this new company, but I can't say what it is. And um, I'm like, okay. So that ended up being more of snowboards. And then that was my first sponsor. That was like a special thing, Moro, back then in the, the very early days. It was like a full family thing where they're all involved. And I mean, it was a totally different vibe than any other snowboard company I would think you were involved with. Oh, yeah. It was totally home style, stay at Rob's, like mom's house. She would cook dinner for the team. And that was so great because I was young. And that was like my introduction to traveling on my own without like my brother and my parents. So, I mean, what a perfect transition. I felt safe. And she's just amazing. Rob's awesome. And it was a lot of fun. In those Moro years, I mean, you're in college as well. So you're at the University of Colorado and you're starting to travel for Moro. Is this like the 92, 93, like the ISF title years where you pretty much took over that tour? Yeah, that was 92, 93. Yep. And I believe that tour was based a lot in Europe. Yeah. Were you traveling over to Europe a ton? No, I mean, the World Cup series i think it was three events and it was i have like actually the magazine just sitting in front of you i do actually <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah see i have this 1992 trans world snowboarding magazine they have like the results of all these events but they don't have the world cup in this one but there weren't tons of events and as far as school went i went for the fall semester and i took off the spring until i could just no longer do that anymore and i had to make a decision but you know, it was like France, Japan, and Aspen, I think, was one of the World Cup tours. I don't remember the other one. And, you know, when you have all the success and you decide that college can wait, are your folks cool with it? They're like, hey, she's successful. She's happy. We're going to just let her go do her thing. Yeah, I mean, my dad really saw snowboarding as a sport that was going to be something big. He really saw that. And, you know, along the way... My parents were supportive of snowboarding, yet at the same time, like, don't put all your eggs in one basket because we don't really know if that's going to be worth it. You know, and I agreed. So we just did both until it was apparent that either I needed to be a full time student because I needed to take second semester classes or I needed to become a pro snowboarder. But, you know, when I won the World Cup, everything's going well, like, may as well take the opportunity. Now it's time to jump back into another sponsor break, and Peter Glenn Ski and Sports is giving away a 686 Hydrostash jacket, the only jacket on the market with a built-in personal hydration system, which allows you to store hot or cold liquids to keep you hydrated when you are on the slopes. Hydrostash is a great feature, and it's even more important in a COVID world, where it can be challenging to hydrate on the mountain when slopeside dining is closed. To enter to win a Hydrostash 686 jacket today, head on over to Peter Glenn Sports on Instagram and like the 686 Hydrostash giveaway post. You need to follow both 686 and Peter Glenn Sports on Instagram, tag two friends in the comments section, and a winner will be drawn on Friday, February 12th. The jacket is sick and you are going to want to enter this one. Next up, it's Glade Optics out of Breckenridge, Colorado. They're the little guys competing in a corporate goggle world. And I will say, after using my MagFlight goggles for a month now, Glade's goggles are every bit as good as what the big guys are making. I don't fog up, my kid thinks I look cooler because my goggles aren't as gigantic, and I've never had an easier lens to change. They're just as good as a $300 pair of goggles from one of the corporate brands, and I'm going to save you money on your purchase. What you need to do is head on over to shopglade.com, pick out your goggles, enter the code TPM10, there are no spaces, and you will get the hookup when you check out. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. At this point in life, while you're in college, I think this is, is when you find God, for lack of a better term. And I know Jim Rippey had a moment in the mountains where he found God. Dave said he has faith, but he never really said that he had a God moment. And he didn't really like when I said religion that much. He was more about faith. But it sounds like you had a, a God moment where you were back from college, you're bored, sitting at home, and you're crying out for something? Or what, ha what happens when you call out for something and then you receive it months later in, in Italy? Yeah, so I grew up 
if you want to say religion, you know, going to like Catholic church and all that. And so I believed in God. But then I got into like in college, there was like the self-help section of the bookstore, right? That I think was pretty new. I discovered like all these like new agey kind of books in the self-help section. And I just felt like I didn't have peace. Like I didn't know why I didn't have peace. I just was like, gosh, I just I don't really feel great, even though like there's all these fine things happening in my life. You're like a champion snowboarder. You're in college. You've got a great supportive family. You have all this stuff going on, but there's still like an empty void in your life. Yeah. And I was really at a point. So all these books, like I discovered through them visualization that really helped my sport, actually. So I kept that, but it didn't help my peace in in me, my soul. And like, what is the purpose of life? So really, when I tore my ACL, I was at home and I took the year off of school. So like all my friends went back to school and stuff. And anyway, I just had like massive amounts of quiet time, total solitude. Like I'd just go out for a hike and go out all day, not bring water and stuff. And just because I just started hiking, I wasn't thinking. And then bike rides and rehab. And it was just so much solitude. And I just was like, what is going on? Like, what is life all about? You know what I mean? So I just kind of got to a place of total frustration. Just to be totally honest, I laid in my bed and I just bawled and I just shouted out to like, I was just like, God, who are you? Like, I just truly believe you made this world like you made trees and you made life but who the heck are you and if you can make these things then you can definitely speak to me and I need you to speak to me because all these books I'm reading I just felt like were crap like they're not addressing anything to me and I'm following them and I'm listening to them and I'm like a disciple of these stupid books (laughs) that's what I felt like and you know some of the things that I read you know, you visualize, you do this, you self respect. And like, the more I looked at myself, I didn't like what was in me. I didn't need to look more within me. That's all I was doing day in and day night. So anyway, what my cry was, and I was like, and God, if it's possible, can I please meet my husband? I don't even want to date anymore. It's like job interview. I hate this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want to hang out with a guy unless he's going to be my husband. And can I please meet my husband? And so that was the cry out. And then that trip to Italy, that was crazy. And I met Dave and it wasn't like, oh, this is the guy I'm going to marry. But I got to know Dave. And, you know, in that year, I was like, this is the guy I'm going to marry. And I remember calling my mom and saying, I'm marrying this guy. This is who I'm going to marry. And, you know, when we started hanging out that summer a lot, I was like, can you take me to church or can you get me a Bible? That's what I said. That's hot. Can you get me a Bible? I just, I felt like that was it. And he's like, okay. And I go, well, is there a church that like teaches this Bible? <laughs> because <it's, laughs> Like, I don't want get up, sit down, stand up, whatever you call that. Dave calls that religion, whatever you want to label that. I didn't want that. I wanted to know who God was for real. And I needed a real interaction with God. So that's kind of where I started with that. Yeah. And so we'll say you asked for God to get you a husband and it happened within months. You found Dave and it really worked out. And Dave is like a man of faith. And that must make it easier to be spiritual in the world of snowboarding when you have a partner who's on the same page. But faith and religion is not something that seems like super cool to throw out in the world of snowboarding, which is made up of cool people and it's an inherently cool sport. And religion, while it is cool to people that are super involved in it, it's a personal decision. And I don't even know where I'm going with this. (laughs) Does religion or being faithful make you almost weird in the world of snowboarding? Well, it's kind of like I was discovering, God, who, like, again, who are you? Like, show who you are to me. So it wasn't like I'm following these things. It's just like I'd read the Bible and discovering who, like, God is. If anybody reads the Bible, it's like God is loving and kind and generous. And like, 
oh god loves me like what does that mean I really truly needed like God to truly show himself to me if this word I'm reading is true then you also have to give me an experience that is also true and so like I have a ton of those experiences that I won't go into, but like, that's the discovery of God and Jesus. And so it's not like I now follow these rules. And even if people look at me when I said, okay, I accept Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead and like this miraculous thing and like receiving a present that I did my transformation wasn't instant. And I don't even think a lot of people would even realize that for me. So it's like, as I'm discovering who God is, I can't be like, God is this and that and uh, this and that. Yeah, you're in a learning phase. You can't teach anybody when you're trying to figure it out. And I still like am. And so I think that's the presumption is like, you call yourself a Christian while well, you're a big hypocrite. But like, for me, I'm discovering this awesome God that loves me. And out of that, I hopefully I'm going to change and be a better human, but it's not because I'm trying. It's because God's showing me who he is. And it's like, that's pretty amazing. So I don't know what to say. I think, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's like maybe a different way. I don't even know how to answer. I, don't, I guess I don't know what that question is either, but it's just a discovery process of like, whoa, this big God, you made the trees and you also made me and you really love me. And whoa, what does that mean? It's so much bigger than all of us and just so hard to comprehend even just little pieces of it. So you can spend your lifetime learning about it. But oh, yeah. in this world of snowboarding, I guess you're like the rock star, but you're like the rock star is the lead singer of Creed or Evanescence because you have a little bit of faith to you. But you're traveling into a ton of contests. You're flying the Moro flag. But like two years in, you end up on Sims. And what happens with Moro? Well, Brad Stewart left Moro to start his company Bonfire and be like a photographer. And there was just like inner workings that I didn't even understand, you know. But he's like, well, you can stay with Moro. It might be a little bit of a rocky road. Not sure how that's going to work out. So I just put my feelers out and my dad helped a lot. And we found Sims. I decided to ride for Sims and that was in what 93. So I rode like a mini Palmer board. I remember winning the US Open and saying I couldn't have done it without my mini Palmer. Did you get to travel with Palmer at all? Because I would think that would be yeah. an interesting dude to be around, especially just being who you are. Definitely interesting dude. For sure. I mean, you look at all the footage and everything he's done, other than all his athletic prowess, because he's proven that he's a badass when it comes to snowboarding, biking, and skiing. But oh, everything yeah. else, he's proven that he can be an idiot, too. He summed it up perfectly. Total badass. Loved how he rode and respect his snowboarding abilities and all that stuff. Then he'd just be like, such. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? So, yeah, we traveled a little bit. He's just really hilarious. Hilarious? Were there ever embarrassing moments where you're like, I can't believe I'm with him and he's doing this? I mean, he's just, I don't know. I can't, okay. I can't even say. He's just out of hand, basically. Well, the person in the, in the early 90s who wasn't out of hand, who was like your BFF back then. And at this time, there was like not too many women in snowboarding. There weren't even that many token women in snowboarding. There just weren't that many. But Tina Basich, which you brought her up earlier, you and her were the ones that really changed things. I mean, is the difficulty and amplitude that you guys brought to the table, was that like a totally different level? And when did you guys find each other, per se? So I met Tina in 1990 at an A-Basin contest. And she was just from the very beginning, just like, oh, hi, what's your name? You know, it was like super friendly. And we still joke about this as I complimented her on her scrunchie because it matched her pants I was <laughs> like oh my gosh I love your scrunchie <laughs> so we just connected and we just would start joking about stuff and she introduced me to everybody because that was my first pro event ever and then I don't know she introduced me to the OP people and I got sponsored by them and then it was in contact through her that I would communicate to the sponsor my first sponsor and then to Lisa Hudson who was with Airwalk and so it was like those connections. And then we started 
seeing each other at the events and just laughing and joking. And then we started traveling together. I mean, your careers are so intertwined with all that you did. It's like you become BFFs and start traveling together snowboard wise. And it's perfect that you have another woman to travel with. But I think the first thing you guys do is put out a CD-ROM together. No one even knows what that means anymore. (laughs) You guys did prom, which we talked about. I think a big standout moment for the two of you and for women in general, when you were denied entry into the 94 Air and Style event, and like as a middle finger to everyone, you and Tina dress up in pink and poach the jump. And at the end of the day, when you do something like that for women, and it might not be for women, it might be for yourselves, but... Does it do anything to help the cause? Do people look back at that and be like, that was a big deal? Or was it just something in the moment? I think it was a very big deal, but I'm not sure how much was attributed to that. Like nobody remembers or anything. But I think the next time the event happens, it's like, oh, well, I think the girls can do that. They have seen it. They've seen a girl go off a big jump and stuff like that. So for us, just to kind of tell a little bit more about that story, her brother, Mikey, was doing the Aaron Style, Red Bull Aaron Style, and the scaffolding's up, and he's hiking to the top, and we're like, oh, let's check this out. And then we just, like, strap in our boards because, like, we're just going to check it out, too. And the contest director guy, he was like, you cannot go off this jump. And we're like, well, why not? Because you are girls. You're going to get injured. And we're like, no, we're not. <laughs> like, we're going to go off this jump. Well, you cannot. It's not allowed. Blah, 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 blah. We just kept talking to him like, we're going off this jump. You can't tell us we can't. Well, yeah, I'm the contest organizer. Blah, blah, blah. And then finally we get him to agree like we can go off the jump. But he's like, well, you have to try out. And so we go off the jump and we don't kill ourselves. And he's like, well, we don't have it set up so that you can compete. And we're like, well, we don't care just as long as we can go off during the main event. So he's like, okay, well, you get two tries and you can do that right before the guys go. You can go off the jump. And so we ended up going off in the night and the two girls going off in pink. We put on our most girly clothes, was like pink prom outfits and went off the jump. It was exciting. And then there was a contest before. So like everybody at the contest went to this Aaron style in Austria and all the girls were like, how did you get to do that? We wanted to go off it. And we're like, well, we just did it. So it's funny. And Tina, I mean, we totally fed off each other in every way. Like, even if we were scared, we'd be like, yeah, we could do this. And then the other would be like agreeing. Yeah, we can do that. And then one thing leads to the next and we're actually doing it. Or we'd have an idea like, we need to do this. We need to promote this. We need to get photos here. And because it was two of us, we could like, call the photographer and we want to blah, blah, blah. And let's do this story idea magazine, you know? So if it wasn't for her, I know I wouldn't have individually done all this stuff. And I don't think she would. It's just like us together. And then we kind of take it for granted. Like every girl would do that, but they don't. It's just like the way Tina's personality and my personality lined up, it just worked. And that's why we... We're just kind of inseparable and gung-ho on promoting the sport and doing everything that we could. And it was so fun to do it together. And when it was time to make a difference in the sport, you guys did it better than anybody else because you guys created boarding for breast cancer. I think that's a personal event for you guys. You have a friend who gets breast cancer. You're going to raise some money. Unfortunately, she didn't make it. But what you guys were able to do with boarding for breast cancer and the people that you were able to educate and just the cause of it all. I mean, before there was pink everything everywhere. You guys were having an event. I mean, what do you think when you watch like an NFL game on a Sunday and every team is wearing pink in October and it's all for marketing purposes and try to get women into football, really? They can say whatever they want, that it's like, you know, they're trying to raise money. But that's why that is. That's why it was 15 years after most people were doing stuff. But what do you think when you see everybody else doing something that was really a passion based thing for you that you really helped start in snow? Or what are your thoughts on the selling of causes, I guess would be the question. I mean, people are always trying to promote their cause and you have to like market the cause. But I mean, I kind of don't view things like that. You know, there's a whole awesome group of women in the snowboarding industry and they've always stuck together, whether beside boarding for breast cancer, it was just sticking together as a group of women within the industry on the industry side 
and then the athlete side, Tina and I were connected with them, like through Gailey Nagel and Lisa Hudson and just like a big group. And Monica Stewart, who is the woman who died of breast cancer, but they all stuck together to help each other because there were just few women within the industry on the industry side of things. So we just had that connection. And so we wanted to help that cause it was just like a group effort, you know what I mean? And so Tina and I were like the athlete side of things. So it was just one thing led to the next and we we're just helping each other and doing something that could make a difference and using all of our resources together to make it happen, you know? And so that's when the Beastie Boys came. Well, they came under the name of Quasar because they couldn't use the Beastie Boys name. But that just drew in so many people. I mean, it's the Beastie Boys. And anybody who heard about it would want to go see it. And then the articles and stuff, people talking about it afterwards and people realizing who was there. It just became so big that that was an annual event that everybody was waiting for. And it was bigger than snowboarding. And it was the first thing that I can think of within snowboarding that was bigger than snowboarding. That actually, like, it was a big cause. And it's pretty cool to be able to hang your hat on that. Yeah. And it's not like we were like, let's create the biggest thing ever. It was just like, let's do something in honor of our friend, a woman in the industry. We're going to all rally around her. And then, like I said, just using their resources. You know, it wasn't like Tina's out trying to make friends with the Beastie Boys. I'm going to tell that story really quick because it's super cool, I think. Yeah. She was with the Kemper team in Australia and she was riding just by herself because she didn't want to keep up with the guys. And I think it was bad weather. And this other guy was snowboarding by himself and they just kind of kept running into the same lift line together and just started talking and, oh, I guess Adam's going to lunch. And so she met the Kemper guys and they were like talking about, they heard that Adam from the BC boys was riding around the mountain and he has green hair. And so they go back out to ride and Tina just connects with this guy again because the other guys take off. And she invites him to the bar with the Kemper crew after, you know, never gets his name. And then he's like, okay. And then they introduce each other at the bar. He takes off his hat. He has the green hair. And they're like, oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) That's so crazy. I know. And then Adam just wanted to spend some time in Utah in the winter. So Tina is just like, hey, I have an extra room. You know, I'm traveling a lot. But like, if you just want to, whenever you want to just take that room you know he ended up being her roommate yeah and he like rapped about it yeah when the snow was falling i'm gone and he was like always going to utah totally and he was just like a quiet super super nice guy like quiet and loved snowboarding and i remember when i switched sponsors from sims to burton i got some flack well let's just talk about the switch real quick and then we'll talk about you getting flack but you would put out that pro model It's like the most popular board in like the history of women's snowboarding at that point because it's the first women's pro model out there and you're selling a shit ton of them. How long are you on Sims before you leave to go to Burton? So I was just with them like two years. So they have to be pretty bummed when you leave because you've got this pro model and they put a lot on the line because when they put out this pro model, it was really the woman who was running their marketing pretty much hung her neck out for women. And we're like, hey, this is what we're going to do. And everybody laughed at her and everybody kind of clowned it. And nobody wanted to put your graphic on a board. And eventually you guys got everything that you wanted. The boards were financed by the marketing person. She actually paid for them out of her pocket. And that's how the board gets into key retailers. They sell through immediately. And that's what it takes for Sims to realize that you have some selling power. It's actually not them being smart and being taking a leadership position or doing anything. It's once they see the results. So it's all the the marketing woman who, I forget what her name is, but... Gailey. Yeah, she's the one that makes the difference for women in snowboarding here because the company's not Mm going to do shit and the reps are all (laughs) laughing at you. And then the reps are like, holy shit, we need to make as many of these pro models as possible because we can't sell enough of them. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. But I would say that for any other company, too. But they're all me too after you. I mean, once they see what you've done, though, everybody needs to make something like you. Yeah. So when I met Dave, he was connected with Burton. Right. And he's like, gosh, this board, what is this? This design of this board is just not that rad. And I'm like, really? 
And he's like a tech nerd, right? Like he like knows everything about snowboards. Totally. I mean, he would test snowboards with JG from Burton and he was like the rep. So he knew all the tech stuff and I could care less about anything tech. You just ride them. I just ride them, put my bindings on a different stance every time. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, he was just telling me like, gosh, there'd just be so much opportunity with Burton and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, when Eric asked me about that, I just kind of considered what they had to offer. And then at that point, I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to kind of look at this for what's just going to be best for my career. Because yeah, it's like Gaylene did everything. It was Gaylene. It wasn't necessarily Sims, you know? So I looked at it like with a business perspective lens and then I talked to Gaylene about it and she's like, you know, whatever's best for you. She's just so awesome, you know? Yeah. She has such a bigger perspective. So she she was like, whatever is good for you, that's what's going to be great. So don't consider me or whatever. So I, yeah, decided to go with Burton and then I had to, yeah, there's just kind of a lot. I had a hard time with that whole just negotiating. And then I got some definite negativity from a certain writer that was just not happy that I was on the team. And that really hurt my feelings. <laughs> it really did. It really did hurt. So it was just something that I had to kind of go through, I guess. Was the certain writer also a writer who was anti at the Olympics? Well, sh- it was a Burton writer, and this Burton writer was like, well, that should have been my pro model. Oh. He kind of, like, took that pro model from me, and I was like, well, okay, well, I just, you know, I don't feel like I took a pro model from you. I just negotiated a contract. <laughs> and you know what? You don't make that decision anyway, unless you put that into your contract. Yeah. Do you write a pro model into your contract? Yeah. Okay. Well, you yeah, do put it in your contract. Yeah. But, I mean, either way. If you look at the numbers, you are going to sell a shit ton more pro models because just the fact that there's 30 men's pro models on the wall, there's five women's pro models on the wall, and yeah, you're going to sell more of them. And ultimately, that's what the athletes are there to do is sell product. And, you know, my dad's really good about, you know, like, hey, this is a business. So yeah, you want to do good business and you want to have integrity when you do business, but you're an athlete. Now, snowboarding is a professional sport at this point. You're not just handshakes anymore. And you negotiate. And this is a business. And they have the opportunity, just as same as you, to do business as well. So it's not like I came in to take somebody else's portion away. It was just, I'm making a decision. I didn't even actually think like that at all. So it's fine. That's just part of life. But I think going back to Adam is like one of the cool conversation I had with him was during that time. And I was just like, I'm just having a hard time. Like this person's like thinking I destroyed their career or took something away from their career. And I didn't even consider that. And he's like, you know, you're going to have people that are jealous. You're going to have people that think that, you know, you're taking away an opportunity, but you just got to keep doing what you're doing. And just do the best that you can, you know? I don't know. It was just a cool conversation. It's cool that you look back to a conversation that inspired you and it's from one of the Beastie Boys, which is pretty rad. At this <laughs> point, we're like pretty far into the show and I want to respect your time. So I'm going to go over some things pretty quickly. I could list all the firsts that you did in tricks, but I'm not going to do that. We are going to talk a little about the Olympics. We're going to do it really quickly. At the Olympics, you make the 98 Olympics. It's super exciting because the snowboarding's never been in the Olympics before. This is the first year ever. I should have spent half the podcast on it, but I didn't. But either way, you get into the Olympics and the tricks that you have are more technical than a lot of the other women riders in the, in the games, but they weren't scored as high as one would have thought, or at least a rider would have thought. And when you win the bronze medal at the Olympic Games, do you feel like you were robbed by the judges at the biggest event of your life? Oh, no way, because you got to understand that that Olympics was two runs you have to combine your runs for the top score yep. and my first run I did just like I wanted and I was in first by a lot and then the second run it started to like rain or whatever but I kind of hit my heel edge and hit like a slush puddle so it didn't like hold my edge and I kind of skidded out for my hit 
I lost a lot of speed. I lost that one hit. I didn't fall, but I basically missed a whole hit. And then I finished my run, luckily. And I just say, like, luckily I got third because usually judges are really harsh. I didn't fall. And that's maybe why they let it go. But I just had that mistake. And usually you can't get top three if you have a mistake. And so I just felt like, hey, at least I got third. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's better than getting fourth. I should have won. I could have won, but that's fine. You know, I had to turn it around for that. But there's tons of judging junk that went on. But at that event, I felt like I was very fortunate to get a bronze. And then in the end, you think like, oh, my gosh, this whole Olympic thing. You know, when you get an outside perspective and you're in the Olympics, you're just like, oh, my gosh, it's like one event. Everything rides on this one event. That's kind of ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but it's weird. Anybody that wins an Olympic gold medal, except for Ross Rebliotti, who I just had on the podcast, (laughs) is able to like just speak or do whatever they want and they never have to work again. And it's because they were smart on the marketability part on their side, even even if they weren't, as long as they don't do anything bad. If they have an Olympic gold medal, they can always like speak at Ford Motor Company's annual company Christmas party or something. (laughs) So you do that Olympics and... From there is when you actually just start crushing it. The numbers of podiums that you're on from like 99 to 2002 is just ridiculous. Going into the 2002 Olympics, have you already figured out that Kelly Clark is the next in line or is she already taken over or is that the Olympics where you pass the torch? Kelly, really, her moment was the Olympics. It was crazy. So, I mean, that was phenomenal. And then after that, she just took off, right? But going into that Olympics, I qualified in one weekend for that team. There were two events in Mammoth, and I won them back to back. And I was thinking of, like, talk about a God moment. There's a definite God moment in that where, like, I did a McTwist, and I landed on my ankles weird, and I could literally not even walk. Like, I was going up the lift, and I was like, I can't even snowboard because I crunched both of my ankles so bad. And I was like, God you know, if you want me to snowboard for this contest, because this was like the second of, or no, this was the first event. And I had to go take my final run. And that was like the practice right before the finals. And I go, could you heal my ankles? And then all of a sudden, my ankles just got super tingly. And then they were totally fine. They weren't even sore after the event or anything. I mean, it's wild. That was crazy. But like I said, I qualified for the Olympics. And then I just was like, having such a hard time with the whole thing. Like, I don't know what it was if I was just severely burnt out or whatever, but it was just really hard because I didn't want to go to any of these other contests. I didn't agree with like the stupid coaching, the stupid, that's what I was thinking. You know, it was like, these judges suck. They don't want to see progression, blah, 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 blah. I was just really negative. So I had a hard time, but Kelly really stepped up. And I didn't really even see because I wasn't at the events, the other qualifying events, but she was just like starting to just boost these errors and it was like perfect timing for her. Yeah. I mean, it's like you pass the torch to her and it's like now the torch has been passed and it's Chloe Kim and it's the the progression in the sport is just crazy. I mean, you have to look (laughs) at what's going on and being like, oh my God, I really suck when I look at these girls now. And (laughs) and not that you suck by any means because you're awesome. (laughs) But it's just crazy how good they are. So you're through the Olympics, you're burnt out, you make a hard stop on snowboarding, which I don't know if it's a hard stop, but it's like you don't fully compete anymore. And you go from this like rad snowboarder to someone who's snowboarding a lot, but probably not in the spotlight as much as you were before. And it doesn't seem like you care at all. Like you don't seem to have like an ego and you don't walk up to people and like, I'm a snowboarder. It just happened to be something that you did. And when you stopped doing it on the professional level, Did it bother you at all? Are you psyched to be a mom? Yeah. So the Olympics were in 2002. I got fifth or whatever. And then I was just like, oh, I'm so done with this. Like I was really burnt out. And, you know, I talked to Dave about like, I think I'm ready to have kids. And we just had the conversation. Like he was saying, I don't want you to have any regrets. So if there's anything you want to do in this sport or anything at all, even and ever, go do it, do it. And I was like, I don't, I want to start a family. I'm like really pretty decisive too. Like I'm marrying this guy. I want a family. <laughs> yep. And so 2003, April, my first son was born. 
you know, I try to keep the dream alive, I want to say, and go back to snowboarding. And, you know, you hear stories about like moms going back to their sport, but like it was not working out for me because like the first time back on snow, I got a concussion and then my body just wasn't connected. It was like the first time I ever felt like totally unathletic. Like it was not connecting at all my movements and my brain and all this stuff. And so I, you know, I was sponsored still by Burton for a couple of years. And then I just felt like I wanted to commit to raising these kids. Like I wanted to be involved in every moment if I could, and I was able to financially. And so I was just like, I'm doing this. So that's another whole story just motherhood and getting past professional snowboarding and living in an area, Southern California. Nobody knew me, which is fine, but I just kind of had a little identity crisis there for a little bit. Like you're not getting love from anyone. You don't realize all the accolades, how they do affect you, but I'm thankful for that. That's for sure. Well, everyone who's ever been good at a sport that gets old, figures that out at some point because there's a point where you're not going to be as relevant you're not going to be celebrated and people aren't going to be like hey we want to give you this we want to send you here because you're not winning anymore and that's it's it's amazing that the culture around winning and how once you stop it all kind of dies off but at this point in the show i have something that i call inappropriate questions and i Uh get someone that you know to ask three questions and they can be anything and before i get someone to ask you questions I want to ask you a question about somebody you know. Mm -hmm. There's a pro snowboarder from your era, maybe, I don't know exactly how much you guys overlap, but I believe there is some overlap. Tara Dikitis. Are you friendly with her or familiar with her? Yeah, love Tara. Have you seen her social media? Uh Uh-oh, you're cutting out. Uh Wait, you cut out. It's a good time for me to cut out for you. Have you seen (laughs) her social media? Yes. What are your thoughts on her social media? Because to me... You know, I don't agree with her opinions, but everybody can have their own opinion. Hers are just like so out there and in your face. It would be the last thing I'd expect from anyone coming out of the snowboard world. That's me. What are your thoughts on her social media? I really appreciate Tara and her passion. I think what she's showing is something that is counter narrative for right now. And I really appreciate her stepping up. You know, and just putting that out there to a world that is totally counter. Yeah, it's amazing that she would put it out there, knowing that like everyone she knows must be totally against everything that she says. But I'm not against everything she says. And I think it's this conversation that people need to think deeply, like, what am I listening to? Why am I listening to it? I'm not to tell anybody what to believe. But I think social media right now is just so taking what you look at and giving you more of it. And people are not asking questions. And all we need to do is ask questions instead of getting mad at somebody. Sure. Like have a conversation, even if it's with yourself, like, well, what is she posting? Like, I like to just see a total contradiction, but then have a like conversation because that's philosophical. And that's what people have done for thousands of years, except for right now, people are just shutting off their brains to consider another point of view. And I think it's so beneficial to see another point of view. I just love that she's putting it out there. I think that's so healthy. Yeah, I follow it. Because like I said, while I don't agree with what she's putting out there, I love the fact that people rock the boat on either side, you know, that put their beliefs out there because like, I'm a total I won't put myself out there like that because I don't need people hating on me either way. And you know what? (laughs) My opinion is my opinion for myself. It's not for anybody else in my personal little world. But I just wanted to get your take on that. Now, I have someone that you inspired a lot when she was coming up, Barrett Christie. And she is going to ask you three questions that aren't really that inappropriate. So maybe the Tara question was a little more inappropriate. But I've got (laughs) question number one from Barrett. And here it goes. Uh Uh-uh. Okay, this one might not be so inappropriate, but I'm really curious. You and Tina Bassage were so inspiring to me. I always looked up to you guys. You worked so well together with the same sponsors and events and traded so many firsts for women in snowboarding, showing us all what was possible. Did you ever feel competitive against each other in a place where there was often tokenism and only one girl 
at the top of a team, did you ever feel like you guys were going head to head for some of the similar goals? Ooh, great question. Yeah. Thanks, Barrett. I love that question. No, I would have to say no, because just who Tina is and how we rooted for each other was literally a win. Like we both wanted to win in the way if there's going to be one winner, well, I hope it's Tina or I. Right. (laughs) Outside of that, we're definitely competitive. But for her and I, everything was going to work out better if we did it together and we joined forces. Like it was just way more fun from the very beginning, from the first time I ever met Tina. It was just like she rooted for me and I was like, therefore rooted for her. No, it's cool. cool. And you don't see that all the time. So that's pretty awesome. Let me go with question number two. Shannon, I'm wondering, in 1993, what was sketchier? Going to Costa Rica with the Cummins brothers or riding the (laughs) halfpipes? Definitely going to Costa Rica. Super sketch. What is the sketchiest part of that trip? (laughs) Super sketchy. Bunch of brothers. Never been to Costa Rica. Oh, gosh. The drama. That's what I'm going to get. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'll take it and we'll go to question number three. Okay, and speaking of sketchy, what was the most inappropriate thing you did with your eagle talon? And did it have a spoiler? Oh, yeah, my eagle talon. My dad got a deal on this sport car, Turbo. The bump on the hood? And I don't know if it had a spoiler. Maybe, but it was like all wheel drive and it was turbo. And so I was like, yeah, I'll buy that thing. Dina and I drove to Aspen and I think I also drove it off road in Mammoth and like tore up the whole bottom of it because I was trying to get off road all wheel drive in my <laughs> Eagle Talon. Well, that's awesome. I don't know. Maybe Barrett remembers something sketchy I did in it. I have no idea. Well, we'll leave the off-roading being the sketchy thing. And the thing with you is your life has never really been sketchy. You've been around sketchy people through snowboarding and through life and traveling. And you've never been that person. But through your life and times, it was like you were pioneering for women. You were pioneering a sport. And you ended up on top of snowboarding, dominating for almost like a decade from like 93 to 2002. Shannon Dunn was it in snowboarding. There's a lot of others as well. But when you think about women snowboarders, you were right up there at the top. And it was an amazing career to watch. And then you did it your own way. It was like you wanted to quit when you quit and you started your family. And it's like you've never done what other people have wanted you to do, it seems like. And you've never put snowboarding as what's defined you as been your ego. It's just that you've been Shannon Dunn. So Shannon Dunn downing now. And I thank you for your time. Oh, thanks. It's fun to go through this. So that was time with Shannon Dunn Downing, and what a different and cool story. While most people I interview from the snowboard world seem to remember the party days with a fondness, Shannon remembers them, but it sounds like she did what she could to separate herself from all that crap. She was focused on the riding, the progression, and Dave, not about the party and the lifestyle. And you know what? That's rad. It's different strokes for different folks, and that is true for the life of the legendary Shannon Dunn Downing. That's the podcast for this week. At this point, I want to ask you to review me wherever you listen to me. If you have an iPhone, here is what you need to do. First, click the podcast icon on your iPhone. Second, search for the Powell Movement. Third, click my logo. Fourth, scroll down to where you see the stars. Fifth, hit five stars and you're done. If you want to go the extra mile, you can leave a review. And if you do, you will be in the running for me to read your review as the review of the week on the podcast, which I'm about to do right now. This week's review of the week comes from Yippee Yak, and the title of the review is Best Thing in Ski Journalism. And here's the review. The Powell Movement is the best thing going on in ski journalism right now. The contributions which he is making to ski culture is not to be ignored. From classic hot doggers to 2022 Olympians, Mike has access to everyone. Keep it up, Mike. Well, I thank you for that review. I think I'm the best thing in ski journalism going on right now as well. But there are a lot of other things to think about in ski journalism. Recently, I saw the subscription model being brought up by Ski Magazine. It sounds like they're coming back in a print version and you can pay $99 to get a subscription. You'll also have access to Warren Miller's catalog of movies and it's an interesting play. 
Do you need another subscription service? I don't know. I guess that's to be determined. And I'm sure the folks at Ski Magazine and Mike Rogge over there at the Mountain Gazette, well, they would argue that you should have to pay for some types of media. And when you're getting a physical magazine in your hands, I feel like you should pay for it as well. But podcasts and other content that is available out there, I don't think there should be paywalls for that. And I hope there's not going to. There are ways to support the independent content creator. There's Patreon. There's a lot of other ways. With me, support my sponsors because that's how I get paid. And I've got some amazing sponsors who make this show happen. And it's time for me to close out the show. I might as well call out who those sponsors are. They are Stanley, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Weed Maps, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and Glade Optics. Please support them as they make this show happen. I want to thank you for listening and have a great week, everyone.